And you can tell out here, there's also a lot of wonderful trails, which I happen to be on one right now. Really kind of a beautiful sky today. I like, I like it a lot better when it's completely clear. We have uh, some of the best stargazing here, and here's a couple shots of what I took last week. Almost without exception, uh, up here in these trails, uh, you're going to see deer, birds all, of all kinds. Uh, this is a major migratory route. And you can also see, uh, it's what, what a wonderful county this is over here. It's just one county over from Pima County, which is where Space Fest is. This Car, uh, Car Canyon is actually a road uh, comes up from Sierra Vista. And the county really did a lot of great work on it over the weekend, so it's in pretty good shape actually. Not recommended for trailers or any kind of large vehicles, certainly no RVs. I've seen Border Patrol get some pretty big stuff up here though, but that's pretty much what the road is. And from here, uh, I'm only a third of the way up Car Canyon. I'm going to show you uh, how far I am over Sierra Vista here in a second. Uh, this very famous falls here, and you can you can hear the birds and everything. Uh, I've actually you, there's a place when you get to the top where you can actually look down and see all this. So I'm only a third of the way up, but it's still very beautiful. Uh, here's a good place to stop and tell you where we're going to be doing the uh, uh, event this year and some of the people that we already expect to be there. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my lovely hometown of Sierra Vista. Uh, if you're coming out of the Star Pass Resort uh, west of Tucson, what's going to happen uh, is you're going to get on the I-10 and come out to Benson. Um, it's about a good hour, but another half an hour to get down here to Sierra Vista. And to where I am right now, it's about another half an hour out of Sierra Vista. Now, ladies and gentlemen, is Fort Huachuca, very famous army post. Um, a lot of people are employed there. I would love to get a job there, actually. Um, and there's the morning view of Sierra Vista, Arizona. One of the best things about being up here is um, it's a great place to film almost anything you want. Uh, most days, no contrails, very few power lines or anything like that, so see, you can make anything. Matter of fact, I've made four movies. Uh, I'm working on my fourth right now. It's being filmed right here in Cochise County. So. What a wonderful place this is. Um, speaking of which, one of my goals this year before I, I had to take off of work was to sponsor Space Fest this year. Uh, if you do come or if you're interested, contact the webpage uh, or the people running the event when you get there. Find out how to advertise. I, I quoted the price last year. Uh, very sensible, very, very reasonable to advertise for Space, for space Fest. So uh, it's spacefest.info, I-N-F-O, Space Fest. Just like it sounds dot info and uh, my first one was right when I first got here it was Space Fest 4 and uh, that was a great time met a lot of really cool astronauts there uh, Space Fest 5 went to, that was also here uh, met even more astronauts and I actually did my first special like the one you're watching now uh, then and then Space Fest 6 went out to Pasadena I had to miss that one. Space Fest 7 last year was really really great by the look of things, uh, Space Fest 8 is going to be the very best of all. I'm very uh, pleased this year to meet Dr. Alan Stern for the first time. <coughs> I think Dr. Alan Stern is probably one of the greatest men alive. Uh, this will be the first time I've seen him, but let me tell you about the first time I saw his work. I was in Florida on a very cold January morning in 2006, and I've seen a lot of launches. I've seen 38 sp space shuttle launches plus all the great ones you see out of uh, back in the day, it was called Lockheed Martin. Now it's called United Launch Alliance. I uh, saw a couple of those SpaceX's, you know, whatever. The, 
but this one launch in particular was it, it was a, an Atlas V rocket that we, you saw it go up the, the the horizon so quickly it looked like a bottle rocket I just couldn't believe how fast that, you know you see the little the little rockets about that tall the kids go with and they light them up and they go well that's what this 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 thing looked like well what it was was the fastest uh, departure from Earth ever for uh, any kind of spacecraft and uh, it still took nine years to get close to the planet Pluto and the uh, sister moons such as Charon, Nix and all the others and in uh, January 2019 I think that thing's going to be out there at the very end of the, of the solar system uh, in the Kuiper belt and they've already turned the craft for a encounter or close encounter not as close as it was with with Pluto but it's going to be the first really good close encounter with a um, CBO is what they call a, a Kuiper belt object and they've already have a name for this thing already subject can change the PT1 I think is what they're going to end up settling with but uh, just for the news news purposes but I really do uh, have a lot of excitement for this thing and I just can't believe something that took off that fast took that long at the fastest speed possible uh, to get out to uh, the outer solar system so by 2019 what that would have been 13 years in space going all the way out and as a matter of fact I was so impressed uh, for my new movie slash book which is already out uh, called the Viking Club Liberty 72 you can always find that on Amazon Liberty 72 just like it sounds Liberty the number seven the number two uh, all four books went out in about two months uh, the first three were actually from earlier movies and, and scripting and, and treatments and, and books that we did back between 1996 and 2003 uh, but we put all those back out again as, as new books so you have Liberty 72 when battleships fly Liberty 72 endless wonder uh, be between those two Liberty 72 hidden treasures which was always my favorite until now this new one uh, Liberty 72 the Viking Club is my favorite and I actually have to include the new horizons probe as part of this story because in the year 3550 I still believe it has a chance and one of the people uh, that interviewed me last week about my, my latest book asked why is it that you put so much time between these stories you have this ship that is about like 900 years old by the time you can finally close it all down in the last book and movie project and the reason is I can't afford to rehire these people after I hire them once or I can't find them so uh, I just start with a new career every time so it's kind of like uh, I've never seen Doctor Who, but I guess they have a different actors all the time on this on this show, on that one. So it's kind of like that. So I'll, I'll, I had one character who was through all all through all four be, beyond Doctor Stern, who was you know mentioned in all four. Um, there was one character that went all the way through all four, and it was an alien named uh, Fiona Seacomb, and she can actually let, she can list she lasted like 1,600 years before she also dies in this last movie. But <laughs> the reason I the reason I always had had different uh, people in the mission control center or running the ship was because that that was just a, uh, a way I could afford to get the new actors in, if, especially if I couldn't find the other ones. So, anyways, uh, let me take you uh, right now through a brief summary of some of the people that are, are going to be here and uh, what they've accomplished. And I really hope the news can get down here. Um, and interview these astronauts because they're always a lot of fun. You just would not believe how accessible and friendly and and chatty they are. And uh, Charlie Walker is my favorite chatter. I mean, him and him, him and, and Vance Brand can really t tell you some really good stories. But Charlie just makes me laugh every time I, I talk to him because he's such a nice guy and uh, one of my favorite shuttle, shuttle astronauts. And uh, also very much looking forward to seeing. Our old friend from Clearwater, Florida, uh, 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 her name is Nicole Stott, and she's actually a very famous astronaut who went up on 128 and came down on 129 and went back up and down on 133 to retire the Space Shuttle Discovery. Nicole Stott went up there for, for a long duration flight on her first launch. So by the time she came back, before ever landing or wheels down or splashed down or anything, she had already, already logged more time in space than all of Mercury, all of Gemini, and most of Apollo. And I used to, I used to think all of Apollo until I figured out, well, we also had uh, Skylab up there, plus the Apollo-Soyuz mission. 
which uh, Vance Brand was a very important part of. It was the first docking uh, an American and Soyuz slash Russian craft up in space with uh, interconnected systems, docking rings and that kind of thing. So that was a first for him. Anyways, let's, let's take you back down and we'll uh, run. This is a wonderful place here. And uh, it's the Patterson Observatory at the university. And uh, about every month or so, the uh, Wachuca Astronomy Club, which I joined this year and really enjoyed, uh, has, has an open house here, so that's what we're here to see. Hey there. Hey. What's that? What's the what's the uh, diameter of that the telescope right there? Inch. Is it twenty inch? Okay. I'm, yeah, 4 I'm, I'm telling all my friends at Space Fest so about oh, this. Cool. Tell them to get out of here. You gonna, gonna film it? Not not the whole thing. Just from here. Well, I still have light. All right. Isn't that really great? This is actually controlled by a gyro. Run from a computer Learned right from here. That computer. Yeah. And I saw the software last month, and it's really awesome. But because they like to keep the, the lights out at night, except for the red lights, like what you see in airplanes, uh, 747s to Cessnas uh, during night, not to destroy night vision. They don't have a uh, real joy for lighting up. No, I just went to a star party a couple months ago with my girlfriend in Texas. And I what this does. Right now, it's pointed at the moon. See? Well, not really. I've been a tech guess. Say it's probably going to be Jupiter. Really great place. the Sullivan's Projects Space Fest 8 2017 special. This is a guy I've wanted to meet for a long time, Air Force General Joe Engel. Uh, I knew him from uh, friends out at Dryden, uh, Bill Dana and others who had flown with him in the X-15 project. And uh, this is just, it's a wonderful little Mach 6 aircraft that actually makes, makes it into space. And uh, it often gets confused with the six million dollar man. Uh, that's actually a different shape, but same principle. This is uh, Joe going into the X-15. Now this B-52 is the one at, at Dryden right now. It's uh, NB-008. Actually, there's one just like it. Uh, it's a little bit earlier, actually. Uh, NB-003 in Tucson, which also uh, launched these uh, lifting bodies in X-15s. And for the X-15, they actually had to cut out the back wing of the craft. I'm not really sure you can see it there, but yeah, they had to cut out the, the back wing to make room for the tail of the X-15. That's the XLR-11, a uh, correction, 99. Uh, started out with four 11s, but that's XLR-99, very powerful rocket. And uh, I think Scott, Scott Crossfield was testing it uh, in, in the North American test program. <laughs> And it blew up on the pad, but somehow uh, he managed to live being thrown several dozen feet forward after the canopy separated. And there's uh, MB-008 making his, his climb out uh, from Edwards. This thing actually goes out all the way out to Utah before it launches, and then the suborbital flight uh, takes place from there. And the X-15 will be on the ground much before... Uh, the the B B fifty two will, I think they launched at about forty five thousand feet, and those are gases you see venting from the fuel source and the 
the helium and hydrogen. If you ever get out to the Pima Air Museum, you can see all the labels they have on that thing. And there is the launch of uh, Joe Engel in the X-15, and he lights up the XLR-99, and next thing you know, he's going to space. They had 199 flights in this program. Um, I know a Major Mike Adams died in one of them, and I've quite a few of them uh, had to get repaired after minor crashes. And there's the uh, atmosphere in space heading, heading back from Utah, out down the range out to uh, Dryden uh, Rogers Lake bed, which is also where the early shuttles and the lifting body project also landed at. Just amazing footage. He's uh, from Chapman, Kansas. Uh, and uh, it's real joy after talking with him uh, by electronic or paper communications after all this time to actually get a chance to meet him. It's been a real uh, pleasure, pleasure to do that. Uh, he, went, he was actually selected for Apollo 17, and when they bumped him for a real scientist instead of a real pilot, he went out to fly the this and uh, the shuttle program. He uh, did something very similar to this in flight two of the shuttle Enterprise, which I'll show you later, as well as he also commanded a uh, real mission out to space in the shuttle. Just a wonderful little program. Landed on skids with a uh, wheel's nose wheel. I'm very glad the Space Fest has featured the X-15 this year in their, their uh, projects. There he is, uh, pulling himself out of the X-15 and uh, making his way back to the NASA trailer. I'm doing all these videos chronologically as they happen, so. Now we're going to go on to the Apollo program. Now, I decided editorially to leave out Gemini, but a lot of these pilots and uh, astronauts that are here uh, this year actually were in the Apollo program as well as the Gemini program. There goes Apollo 7, the first manned launch with Walter Cunningham aboard after uh, the tragic loss of Apollo 1 on, on the uh, launch pad. So they had to go redesign the capsule. Uh, the limb was far, far behind, so they decided just to go ahead and check out the capsule and see if it actually worked in space like they thought it would after the safety refinements after the loss of Apollo 1. And so this is the first manned launch with Walter Cunningham aboard. This one here got a lot of crazy press attention, even, even now on YouTube, about some kind of mutiny or whatever. Uh, Walter Cunningham... I asked him about this last year, and he said uh, emphatically, no, nah, that's just all press, being press. And I think uh, back in the 1960s, they invented fake news. He's a really nice guy. Uh, him and his wife, Dottie, are just wonderful, wonderful people. And if you ever get a chance to meet him, please do. Uh, following on with the Gemini program, they actually... Uh, constructed this device that could practice uh, rendezvous and dockings with. The, the Apollo, the redesigned Apollo capsule was much, much roomier uh, compared to the Gemini or even the, the uh, Mercury before that. And so sad we lost our last Mercury astronaut this year, uh, John Glenn. I had a chance to meet four of them, and all four of them were really great. But you can see they had a lot more complexity in the consoles after the redesign. And I still think they said the as sophisticated as the Apollo computer was, there's more uh, computing power in your Android or iPhone. 
but what a great guy he is. Please get down and just shake his hand and meet him and his wife. He's just really a great guy. Uh, the f first Apollo astronaut. Here they are on splashdown. Those little uh, inflatable uh, balloons you see up there are to right the craft in case it lands upside down, which it did a couple times in the program. Go Navy. HS5. Uh, next up, they finally got the limb ready to test in, in space. And so here is Apollo 9 with Dave Scott and uh, another astronaut, Jim McDevitt. Both of these astronauts will be here at Space Fest. Uh, this was the first uh, space launch of the Lunar Excursion Module, the thing that landed on the moon. And once a different contractor than the, the one that built the uh, uh, command module finally got that thing finished, uh, and ready to go they had to test it out and so they put it up in space and went through the simulation of what they would do uh, around the moon because it was late uh, Apollo 8, Apollo 8 uh, had already been to the moon just to see navigation wise uh, if it was possible and what kind of problems they would have and as we see in the history it worked out great with Jim Lovell and his crew mates aboard and so this is not actually the docking ring you see here. This is what you see on everything from here on out through the space shuttle program and the International Space Station. It's a kind of a guide. And we have a hard, solid dock, good dock. And so they go play around in the limb for a while. And they do toss it down into the atmosphere. And here's the command module coming back with a whole lot of smoke and flames. Um, this was not even near as fast as the ones coming back from the moon, but it's still pretty hot. There's your three mains coming out, we think anyway. Well, I see one. I see two. I see three. Both the Apollo program and the Orion and CST programs to follow uh, have the capability to land just fine on two shoots in case one fails. Next up, we're going to skip Apollo 10 uh, because we lost the Apollo 10, Apollo 17 astronaut this year, Gene Cernan. But uh, the most famous part of this, if you ever listen to the audio, is Charlie Zook uh, at Mission Control in Houston uh, making calls back out to Neil after he had announced that the Eagle had landed. <laughs> he said, you got a bunch of guys turning blue down here. It's just, what a great guy. And I'm so grateful that he uh, prayed for me last year when I found out I had cancer. And so uh, Michael Collins actually stayed in orbit. And I think he had the best seat because uh, everything looks good from up there. And he uh, was the first one to go solo around the backside of the moon, completely out of contact, radio signals, and uh, just completely isolated from the rest of humanity. And he got a lot of great pictures. They actually orbited pretty close to the equator on all the all, all the landings, and so when the command module went in orbit, uh, they circled a lot of the moon and got a lot of great pictures. But they really didn't see that much of it. Uh, that was fixed when the lunar reconnaissance orbiter went up a couple years ago, and uh, they've taken some fantastic pictures. In a polar orbit, it takes about two weeks to get all the way through the moon, and they can also see changes. What a sad thing I heard that uh, Alan Bean's not going to be here this year. Alan Bean was one of the moonwalkers that went with Richard Gordon, and uh, just a really great guy. And here they are lighting up uh, on a mission that will get them struck by lightning. They actually lost all, all power in the command uh, module on the way up and just turned out this one engineer had seen this kind of problem before so he made a recommendation called it up to the, to the ship they flipped a switch and it worked and everything came back on uh, 
Uh, there's Alan Bean right there. He's what happened was they after they landed on the moon, uh, they somehow got got the camera pointed into the sun, and it blew out the uh, transducers or whatever they were using at the time, the tubes, whatever, in the cameras. I think there were West Air cameras that Robert Brand worked on. And they didn't have video on the, the surface of the moon the rest of the mission. But in order to make up for that, uh, they took a lot of great pictures. And Alan Bean, uh, before he went uh, to Skylab 3 for his last flight, had actually become quite an accomplished artist who recreated what he had seen on the moon uh, very f with high, f high fidelity and uh, just a great guy. I really enjoyed singing happy birthday to his wife last summer and I'm so sad to hear he's not going to make it this year. Richard Gordon uh, is uh, you know going to be kind of lonely without him because every time I've been to Space Fest and seen these two they've always been together and they're best friends. Uh, they went to the moon together and uh, their friendship and camaraderie, uh, that's more than just being on the same crew. Uh, it, it lasts till this day. If you ever get to see uh, Richard Gordon, uh, please shake his hand and, and tell him hi, because he's a great guy. And here's Apollo 12. Uh, they. They came pretty close to landing on their side, but at the last minute they picked a great spot and put it down. Everybody talks about how great this Elon Musk guy is for putting a Stage one back on the pad, but I'll tell you what, that's nothing compared to hitting this at 238,000 um, miles away on a dime. As I said, uh, here is uh, the landing of Apollo 12. And uh, at the same time, uh, Richard stayed in orbit, just like Michael Collins did back on 11. And, uh, but he was a really good photographer. And most of these guys were up in the, the command module. And he actually spotted the limb down there on the surface. And that's that little uh, thing you see in, in there. And since then, uh, the, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has gotten some really good pictures, including uh, moon boots and uh, all the tracks of the rover, everything. So uh, they can still see the bottom stage of the limb still sitting there, and probably the flags too. But really some great photography that they, these guys caught. Uh, Apollo 12 actually had a very geologically unique area. Uh, like 13 did. Uh, 13 actually turned into 14 because 13 didn't make it down. But so 14 landed where 13 was supposed to. And uh, there's the flag. Uh, there's six of those on the moon right now. And as far as I can guess, maybe China or Russia has a couple little ones attached to the side of a craft. But that's what an accomplishment this was. And as the, as the missions got uh, longer and more things were done and technology was better and the, the cameras got better. Uh, what's interesting to me is that the interest in the Apollo program started to uh, go down a little bit as far as the American attention span, which is kind of sad because 11, 11 was like a two-hour nothingness compared to what these, these guys were doing on uh, 12, 15, 16, and 17. And there's the crew back up on uh, the moon's orbit with Richard. And very shortly, they're going to send this thing back down. And 10 was the only one that didn't crash into the surface. Well, 13, I guess, as well. But there it goes. It's on its way down. And one thing they left on the moon was a seismometer that sent radio signals back to Earth to one of the universities. And you're going to see what happens here when it hits. Uh, Columbia University was the university involved in this. 
and it's amazing how long how long that shock wave lasted. Uh, I guess there's a lot of bounce of the moon, and there's a almost an eclipse. You see in the crested Earth, and there's Apollo 12 back on Earth with the United States Navy, another HS squadron pulling them down. And here's those two good friends I'm talking about, Alan Bean to the left and Richard Gordon on the right. They're almost inseparable. I'm just so so sorry that Alan's not going to be here this year. Uh, but do catch Richard and tell him hi and uh, enjoy it. Now, the interesting thing about Fred Hayes, uh, you wouldn't believe our meeting I actually got it on film back in 2013. Uh, Fred uh, is right there. What a, what a great guy. He lives in Houston right now. And he's going to be out here for Space Fest. Uh, the actor that played him in the movie I've never seen, with you know, I, don't, I can't remember what he was called. It was called Apollo 13, but I think Ron Howard uh, produced it and Tom Hanks uh, was acted as Jim Lovell. Well, the actor that played this guy actually died over the summer. Or over the winter, I can't remember, but I've never seen the movie anyway. But they were getting very close to the moon. All of a sudden, the most mistranslated uh, quote in all of history was said by Fred Hayes. Uh, he said, Houston, we've had a problem. And that got mistranslated many times, and history records something else being said. But if you go back to the original mission tapes, you can actually hear what Fred said. They had a anybody that has a cell phone knows what happened here. Uh, they lost their charger to their power system to, to the craft, and so they were losing power. And they were losing power to the to the with, with, with such speed they could never keep it up long enough to make it home after they flipped around the moon. So first of all, they had to figure out how to even flip around the moon on the right course to send it back uh, to Earth at the right angle on the edge of the Earth for a five degree uh, a five degree uh, re-entry burn at 25,000 miles an hour. So without power they're losing heat and everything else and including life support. So they fortunately had the limb attached and so they Three people went in and lived in somewhere designed for two. Uh, they powered down the Apollo capsule just like you would power down your iPhone if you're uh, stuck on a mountain but you need it for emergencies for when you get back in range. So they powered it down so it wouldn't uh, use up any more power. Then they went to the limb. The problem is uh, there's too much carbon dioxide with three people in there. So instead of uh, deciding to pick straws and figure out who they were going to kill, <laughs> they they uh, des designed this thing. Uh, actually, Houston designed it based on things that were already on board. It was a carbon dioxide remover, and it successfully allowed them to s stay alive in the limb all the way back to uh, almost their Earth entry point. And at what, at, when that happened, they went back into the command module and powered everything back up, and they had enough power to make it home safely, thank God. Up until we lost uh, Challenger or Columbia, this was probably the closest we've come in space anyway to losing somebody, but a brilliant team uh, on the ground and a really good attitude by the crew helped them. So there they are sending their lifeboat away, and they come in at that five degree angle just fine, uh, and the whole world was watching. The whole world was watching. Uh, I've cut out most of the... Uh, most of the great film in here is because of, of time and, and space constraints, but here's a, a Apollo 13 coming back in to, to the uh, landing zone. Great splashdown. Uh, it's and there's Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigart, who later became a congressman in, in California or in Colorado before he died of cancer. But yeah, I've never seen the movie, but what a great one this is. Uh, Richard Nixon uh, declared the mission to success, and based on the fact that you have three astronauts standing there, I agree.
Apollo 14 with the golf club had landed, but Apollo 15 with on Mr. Rogers was something we had never seen before. And uh, this just moved me so much. I, I gotta, I'm going to talk to Dave Scott about this when I when I uh, see him in a couple of days. That this just moved me so much. That I'm not sure who who it was that fell, but the other guy said, you know, he says, "Give me a hand, buddy." And the other guy says, "Oh yeah, come on, here we go." And it's always good to have that backup plan. And I'm sure it's probably off film they return the favor. Apollo 15 was the first one, maybe the second one, I can't remember, that had the, the lunar rover. And uh, this is not visible in this picture, but it will be on the 16 footage. Uh, this is actually just raking. They're not, they're not um, harvesting crops or sowing seeds or anything. They're actually just uh, looking for geology. So these guys just look for something that's interesting. They kind of dug into the surface and scooped it up and brought it back to Earth for study. These guys are all uh, chess pilots, so you got to re remember that they don't, they're not trained geologists. I mean, I'm sure they've had some amateur training like I had with astronomy, but they're not really uh, the kind of scientists that we had on 17. And poor Joe, Joe Engel, as I said before, was bumped for being a test pilot because they wanted to put a geologist on a, on a real flight to the moon so he knew what I guess he would know best what to pick up and where and what it meant those are very uh, heavy spacesuits but uh, here on the ground uh, on earth they're almost unbearable but because the gravity is only one sixth of what it is here on earth uh, it just wasn't so bad they said I think the the hardest part would be the fact the sunlight side is probably 250 degrees plus and uh, the shade is probably 250 degrees minus. All the Apollo uh, program uh, astronauts landed actually on the, the daylight side. I, th I think the one that came closest to a uh, low horizon for Earth was probably 17. That's just because of where they landed. Fifteen probably had the best uh, easy geography, and here they had the camera that they sent back S band and KU band back to Houston, and uh, that camera stayed there and filmed the launch of the upper stage of the lunar excursion module. There it goes. Within a couple, I don't know how long, it's back in orbit. Last time I saw her head, her head turn like that, she was actually in the capsule. You could, they, they shot her from the ground, and you could actually see her head in, in the in, in the in the uh, in the box office. He's also the best Southwest Airlines pilot I ever met. I think he flies Signature Air or somebody like that now. Wow, she's looking good. <laughs> All those pictures I had from my old 80s books, she had an age today. God, I wish I'd really envy her. Right?
thinking. I might get hit by the dump truck going out to the yeah, car. Yeah, that's right. Sooner or later, we all go. But, uh, people say, people say uh, why, why don't you freak out about you guys going to die? You're not, you're not special. <laughs> I was just blessed by Apollo 16 Moonwalker. Uh, Made it back to Earth. And I just can't say enough great stuff about this guy. Uh, he walked on the moon with John Young. And uh, like both of us back in this wonderful year in the early 70s, uh, we weren't near as Christian as we are now, but we sure both enjoyed watching this. Uh, he had a better view than I did. And here's the uh, Saturn V taking off on one of the more beautiful launches. Uh, there are only going to be two more Saturn V launches after this. It'll be 17 and Skylab. And uh, one of those that was not used but was funded and actually built is uh, now in the uh, Kennedy Space Center Museum. It's really a great museum. And I understand probably one at Marshall and a couple of other places too, but they've really taken good, good, good shape of that unused one. And I, I'm always convinced all they got to do is stack it back up and put it on the pad, it'll go. These took off a lot slower than the, uh, than the, the shuttles did. But talking to astronauts who have flown both, and there's only a few, uh, they said this was a much easier ride, even though it got up to 6 Gs and the, the shuttle is uh, trimmed out to, to 3 Gs. And that's because in the lower stage uh, of the atmosphere, uh, the shuttle really shakes and rattles a lot. You think the thing's going to break apart at any second. This was a real smooth ride, they said. And uh, these guys were just really great on the moon. This is by far my, my favorite mission, even when I watched it live as a kid. Just the, techn the technology just had, had improved by so much, but at the same time, this was about the time that America lost interest in Congress and the White House had decided to uh, scuttle uh, three planned launches. I guess because the ratings weren't good, I, I really can't tell, but... I still have mixed feelings about whether it was a good idea to stop it or not, but I'm so glad that LRO got out there uh, and discovered more uh, on the cheap than what the whole Apollo program did from being there. That gold you see in the visor is because it's to, to block radiation uh, from the sun and light. and the astronauts tell me that while they were on the moon, uh, they couldn't see the stars because the, the shade on the gold was just so bright. What you're seeing is probably a lot lighter than what they were able to see through the visors. And there's John Young doing his Navy salute. I don't know how he's doing. I, I keep trying to get Space Fest to get him out here. I interviewed him and John... Uh, John Young and uh, Crippen, uh, right after Ch uh, Columbia was lost, and that was a very interesting interview, and how different they are as far as how they viewed the space program and the kind of risk you want to take to get up there. And here's Charlie. Salute you back, buddy. Now, this is Charlie filming. John's actually uh, on the rover, giving it a really good test spin. I'm not sure how this did compare to the Corvettes or Camaros of the day, but uh, if you listen to the audio of this, they were just really having a blast up there, as I would be too. In the modern day, what they would do is they would just have like a regular relay back to the main craft, but the, since this thing did operate over the horizon uh, beyond line of sight uh, quite often, you had, had to, you had to follow your tracks back to where the the limb was because you couldn't see it anymore. So they had that antenna up on top that made direct contact with Houston from 
or, or the or the deep space network anyway maybe related through Australia but that's why the antenna is pointing back up to Earth all the time here goes John I, I, God, God knows I just love Charlie Duke uh, what, what a great man he is and if anything if, if there's only one astronaut you, you have time to meet at Space Fest make sure you find him and shake his hand because he's the best one out there believe me Uh, from the Apollo program, anyway, we got to throw Nicole Stott and Rhea said, and, and you know all the, all the other great ones too. But I'm just talking. If you got to meet one, make sure it's Charlie Duke. I can sure use one of those things to get, get up Car Canyon. Believe me. into the sunset and here's Apollo 16 making its splash down uh, they made a Navy guy out of Charlie Duke yet one of the most beautiful la launches and landings I've seen in one of the most photo photogenic missions uh, just really enjoy the whole thing from end to end actually the whole last three missions were really great as far as photography and, and eye candy And I hope they give uh, Charlie a shellback ceremony. I think he landed this one south of the equator. Once again, there is the SH-3s from my United States Navy providing rescue, dropping some frogmen in the water. As they called Navy SEALs back then, and they brought the capsule and the crew back safely. Uh, we lost our we lost our 17 representation this year, so we're going to skip that and go to Skylab, uh, which was the last launch of the Apollo Saturn V. This is actually didn't have a third stage with fuel in it. They emptied it out and turned a, a space a space hab into it. Uh, so it was the first version of what you see now with the Mir space station or the International Space Station. And it took an awful lot of rocket to get something that big up there. So uh, that whole that whole uh, top part there is actually the Skylab itself. What happened was um, they had a problem with deploying one of the solar arrays, or maybe both of them, or all four. I don't. I can't remember what happened. Uh, and they blew out part of the side, not not to the point of losing air pressure inside, but what happened was they. Uh, didn't have a capability to, to produce, produce enough power for uh, life support or heat or maybe, maybe I should say cooling because up there I understand the problem was it was very very hot once they got inside and there wasn't enough power to cool it down to what would be normal 72 degrees uh, in space and so on the next mission this one here uh, the first thing they had to do was get up there, do some EVAs, and fix that thing. And also, that was their first chance to do a, a eyes on to what the problem was, and they developed a very ingenious plan to fix it. That's one of the most unreported things I think in the space space program was how they saved Skylab for use uh, once they got up there. This was a uh, Saturn 1B. And I think, I think, uh, per square inch, I think probably Skylab had the most room of all, even more than the space station. Well, maybe not, maybe not. But yeah, they had an awful lot of room up there per person, as you can tell. You just packed it full of experiments and everything, and... Uh, I just really can't wait to show you my my uh, shuttle my shuttle segment of this special because it's just so awesome to go watch uh, Cabana go up there with uh, the first Unity module made it up with the Russian segment and next thing you know you have a space station and boy that thing really has grown 
But even to this day, uh, you can see things from Cabana's footage that is still up there, and you can recognize it if you look at the new stuff. They've moved a couple modules around here or there over time, but um, everything's really going well up there. I think this is when they had to go out and fix fix the. Uh, they had they had to do something to do a sunshade, and get that other uh, solar thing working. This has to be on the way back. They they really back in the seventies. They actually had this a lot on the news. What they were doing day to day and. What looked like really high tech back in the 70s, uh, it's not anymore, but uh, it was fantastic technology back then for, in that day. And here they are burning back into Earth for Skylab 2. Once again, not near with the heat that was coming back from the moon for that Apollo capsule, but you can still see the plasma trail. Once again, Navy to the rescue. So here's uh, Skylab 2 coming in. And if you get a chance to meet uh, Mr. White's, please, uh, please do. And we're going to see yet another Navy hero, but he uh, got in the wrong ship and ended up in the Marine Corps. Uh, Jack's a great guy. I didn't even know he was on Skylab 3. Uh, with Alan Bean was on there too. So uh, once again, we're going to miss him this year. But this view kind of shows you the huge uh, expanse of that third stage of that Apollo 5 that they had transformed into the Skylab. They had a lot of luxuries back then that the, uh, the, the modern uh, crew doesn't have, including taking showers. Uh, they, you can't do that in space anymore. But one thing you do see still is all of emphasis on exercise and that kind of thing. And this, by far, is one of my favorite parts of the Skylab mission. These guys were really uh, masterful. It was Alan Bean and, and Jack. Jack went on to fly a space shuttle mission that um, was the only one that landed in White Sands, and I'll cover that in the next part. And this is the, the very end of the Apollo program. They had one capsule, uh, one S, uh, Saturn S-1B. And next thing you know, on another beautiful day, uh, looking down from the top of the vehicle assembly building down the causeway, uh, you're going to see a great launch. Now you see all these people on the banana, the banana causeway. Uh, for more than half the shuttle program, they allowed us to drive our cars out there. And after 9-11, they shuttled that down and decided to charge 60 bucks to get in and and uh, you had to get ticketed just to fit on the bus. So things really have had it downhill at Kennedy since then. But, and they, they know I'm unhappy with it. This is lo looking from the west. But the Banana Causeway is really a great place to see launches from. That's where I saw Eileen Collins uh, take off from um, STS-114 plus many other launches. But I, I'm, I'm fine out of the, on the, uh, across the river over in Broward Park. Uh, that was Admiral Dick Truly, who actually went on later to fly his own mission. And there's the last staging of a Saturn in world history. And uh, they had they, they had attached this thing behind uh, the the, sec the third stage, I guess. And it contained this this module, which is like the PMM um, that they use now on the, on the shuttle. Or the mirror or anything else that's, that's connecting to the space station is they have this little adapter that they, they put on there and it allows for uh, two countries to meet in this in this case the countries were the Soviet Union and America and the, the Soyuz had actually taken off it hasn't changed much since then <laughs> it's not, not a really a very impressive craft but hey it's still flying uh, they came on and saw this advanced American technology, and I understand we're just blown away. But Advanced Brand is a great guy. Uh, this was when um, the United States and, and the Soviet Union were having a lot of problems, and this was really instrumental 
And you got a lot of guys at NASA that learn Russian and vice versa uh, from Roscosmos or whatever it was called back then. And uh, when they when they separated from each other after a lot of pomp and circumstance and actually j true friendship, according to Vance, uh, they got a lot of great pictures of the others. The the green uh, Soyuz it always reminded me of what what the inspiration was behind the Star Trek uh, Klingon vessel. <laughs> And you can see the changes in the Apollo there because that module's still uh, attached to the front that it connected to. And that was taken up by Apollo, but it was discarded. I don't know if it's in the film or not, but it was discarded uh, before reentry. As was the service module. From all the pictures you ever see of Apollo's capsule, it looks like some kind of a metallic chrome. But once you see it up close, you see there's a lot of very detailed honeycomb um, design in it. And so it looks it's a lot more sophisticated and detailed than you think. And uh, here it comes in for the last time on three mains. Once again, Navy to the rescue, another SH-3. And here is the end of the Apollo program. Now this guy named Cy comes out to Space Fest a lot. He apparently was a big wig at it. Uh, he's, he was like Mike, Mike Limbacher for the uh, shuttle program. So he's a big wicket at NASA. And there they come out for the very last time. And that would end Apollo.